Berkeley, 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, and 97.5 K248BR in Santa Cruz. Also online all the time at kpfa.org. Stay tuned now at 7 p.m. Apex Express is next. Apex Express, Asian Pacific Expression. Community and cultural coverage. Music and calendar. New visions and voices. Coming to you with an Asian Pacific Islander point of view. It's time to get on board the Apex Express. Welcome to tonight's pre-holiday edition of Apex Express, a show that brings you Asian and Asian American point of view right here on 94.1 FM and online at kpfa.org. I'm your host and producer tonight, Preeti Mangla Shekhar. Tonight, we, spl- we spotlight the island country of Sri Lanka in our monthly South Asia special. But first, an update from the Philippines. Before we dive into the recent elections that just took place in the island country of Sri Lanka, we bring you an important update from the Philippines. Um, In this uh, upcoming update from the Philippines by Bayan USA, uh, we bring you, uh, we explore President Duterte's accomplishments in the Philippines at his, during his um, at his midterm of three years and what people are doing to stop him in his tracks to completing a full term as the year comes to a close. Listen up. If you don't know much about President Duterte of the Philippines, here is a recap of his accomplishments halfway through his six-year term. He has achieved extrajudicially killing more than 30,000 people, mostly from poor communities under the guise of a drug war. Unleashing the Philippine National Police to commit these crimes without prosecution. He was able to declare martial law on the whole island of Mindanao, which is still in full effect, supposedly until the end of this year. Through this, he was able to bomb Marawi City to rubble, enforce a curfew and checkpoints, and conduct mass arrests, especially of activists, human rights defenders, community leaders, and indigenous peoples defending their ancestral lands. He has successfully increased the price of basic goods and commodities and increased the taxes for the already poor people through establishing and implementing the train law tax reform. Unemployment has risen to 10.9 million people. He has achieved consolidating his power in all three branches of the government with the midterm elections this past May, securing the Senate. This amount of power would allow him to push charter change or constitutional changes more swiftly and potentially extend his own term in office. He has made violent threats to journalists and press, women, the church, and anyone in opposition to him. He even successfully removed Chief Justice Sereno from her position because of her criticisms of his deadly drug war. He has jailed Senator De Lima, journalist Maria Reza, and workers' rights activist Marklin Majao Maga, and recently raided various progressive organizations' offices of Bayan, Gabriela, and others, arresting 57 people, adding to the more than 532 political prisoners. Fortunately, 32 of the 57 were released due to lack of evidence. In addition, President Duterte can add to his list the attempted murder of Brandon Lee, a U.S. citizen who moved to the Philippines in 2010 to join the movement for environmental justice and indigenous rights in the Cordilleras and served as a journalist for Northern Dispatch. He was shot four times by the armed forces of the Philippines and survived multiple cardiac arrests. Despite the continued harassment of Duterte's goons, Brandon Lee's family, organizations, friends, and supporters successfully launched a Save Brandon Lee campaign to bring him safely to the U.S. to complete his recovery. 
Duterte has continued the legacy of presidents before him in building unequal relationships with the United States and China and, in effect, sold out Philippine sovereignty. The U.S. alone gives $193.5 million of our tax money to fund the Philippine police and military, the very same police and military that have been murdering the poor and killing activists, human rights lawyers, peasants, mayors, priests, among many others. President Duterte does not share these accomplishments, but instead continues to tell the world a fictional story of the situation in the Philippines while puffing himself up to be the biggest, baddest president the Philippines has ever seen. Actually, he is. He is the worst president the nation has endured, and it has only been three years. Is it really going to be another three years of the same violent, fascist regime? Bayan USA and the Malaya movement are taking action to build a movement against Duterte's dictatorship and for genuine democracy and freedom in the Philippines. More than a thousand people across the United States joined together in protest for a United People's State of the Nation address this past July, one of the largest mobilizations against Duterte in the United States. Let us continue to grow this movement and join forces to end the violence in the Philippines. For more information, please visit bayanusa.org and malayamovement.com. This has been Updates from the Philippines, reported to you by Jessica Antonio and Bayan USA. Thank you, Jessica. Uh, that was Jessica Antonio, a guest producer with Apex Express and also uh, part of Bayan USA, an alliance of 29 progressive Filipino organizations in the U.S. representing students, scholars, women, workers, artists, and youth. As the first and largest international chapter of Bayan Philippines, Bayan USA serves as an information bureau for the National Democratic Movement of the Philippines and is a center for educating, organizing, and mobilizing anti-imperialist and progressive Filipinos in the U.S. For more details, please visit bayanusa.org. That's B-A-Y-A-N-U-S-A dot O-R-G. Up next, we turn the spotlight on Sri Lanka. In the recently concluded elections in the country, Sri Lanka's former wartime defense minister, Gotabaya Rajapaksha, won last week's presidential elections that has split the country along ethnic lines. Official results showed that Rajapaksha, 70 years old, took more than 50% of the vote, while his rival uh, Premadasa quickly conceded. Rajapaksa was declared the clear quote victor in a Sinhalese majority in Sinhalese majority areas and uh, Premadasa scored better in the Tamil dominated north. This election is uh, Sri Lanka's first since the deadly April Easter Sunday attacks and uh, while this may seem benign information to the lay reader or listener um, the results actually deal a severe blow to human rights and the rights of minority communities in Sri Lanka uh, and also speak to the rise of Buddhist fundamentalism in the country. So here to share their insights, reflections and analysis about the elections and about Sri Lanka, uh, a vital part of South Asia, but a country we really don't hear from much. We have two wonderful guests. Uh, We have Gayatri. Um, Gayatri uh, is all the way in Jaffna in Sri Lanka. uh, um, Gayatri, can you hear me? Yes, okay. That's Gayatri Divakalala, uh, well, a feminist researcher and activist. Hello. Welcome, Gayatri. Thank you. Thank you, and thanks for having me. Great. On Great. Um, thanks for, you know, negotiating the time difference and being there. It's morning in Sri Lanka, Friday morning. Uh, no so worries. glad you could make time. Thank you. And uh, close... Awake. Great. <laughs> and close at home, we have Venuri. Uh, Venuri, Venuri Siriwardhan... Vinuri Sirivardhani, a writer, researcher with an eye on social media culture and South Asian American affairs. Um, Vinuri, are you there? 
Yes, I'm here, Preeti. Great Good to be with you. Great, thank you. Uh, Benuri has worked as a business and technology journalist in New York before switching gears to earning her degrees in master's degrees in politics and communications from the London School of Economics. And her uh, research explored the Sri Lankan government's attempts to legitimize itself in state-controlled newspaper discourse. Currently, uh, Venuri's work is based in New Jersey and divides the time between California and Jersey. Welcome both of you. Um, really, if we could cut to the chase and talk, we have uh, the rest of the hour to talk about Sri Lanka, but we never ever hear enough um, um, about what's happening there. So can we begin, Kaitri, with you? You're there, uh, your responses to the elections, and what does it signify, and why is it disturbing? Sure. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, hi, Venerie. Um, and hi, Kaitri. Who's listening to this? Uh, yeah. So, um, I can just start by talking about what does the last week mean to most of the people on this island. Um, I think, as clearly mentioned uh, in the background of this uh, segment of this program, um, the election clearly, or the results of the election clearly shows that this country is painfully divided along the ethnic divisions or along the ethnic identities. Um, once again, the signal of Buddhist nationalism seems to be um, reinstated, um, and with um, such, um, I would say, uh, like, I don't know if to some extent where people, even before the election, just before the election day, or a few months before the election day, everybody kind of knew that this particular victory is going to happen because um, at the end of the day, it's the majority, so majority in numbers that speaks and um, the signal of Buddhist um, nationalistic thinking um, is with the majority of people. So that's really uh, disturbing and, um, yeah, painful too. Um, and I guess it also has showed us that um, ideas of uh, democracy and freedom are at stake. Um, I wouldn't say that this particular regime is the sole responsibility of that, of the whole uh, sole responsibility, but I mean, this has been... Um, the history of this country for decades. Um, however, um, we have had pockets of administration where we could do um, the work that we would like to do. Like when I say we, it's just either social movements or so people who do civil society work. Um, but this particular regime has its record um, that shows or, I mean, where people have, like, again, painfully realize or experience that uh, ideas of democracy and freedom uh, are not in their cards. Um, and thirdly, um, it also um, shows that this president is not a uh, real representative of the entire country. So, yeah, so what that, uh, or what that, what does that mean? to the four I mean, people, uh, I mean, a large number of people who have voted against them. So, yeah, the deep concerns and worries among the people who are not from a uh, single Buddhist background. Ooh. Uh, Gayatri, sorry, yeah, my mic, my mic was off. So uh, earlier, when I introduced you uh, as a feminist researcher and activist, I didn't also get to read uh, some of the wonderful work you've been doing. I want to share a little bit with our listeners before asking you my next question, and then I shall also invite uh, Venuri into this conversation. Um, uh, you've been engaged in community-based development and advocacy programs, research, uh, teaching and activism and you've worked in the northern and eastern parts of the country where uh, the minority Tamil communities largely reside um, and you've also worked with uh, you know you work, you're a feminist activist and challenging uh, patriarchal norms and structures in the country and working for women's rights uh, can you tell us a little bit more about the work you've been doing as a feminist activist in Sri Lanka 
Um, sure. So, uh, again, like, generally speaking, um, it, I mean, the kind of work that, or social activism that I do um, goes along with uh, the current context and, like, you know, what has kind of evolved from the communities that I work with. So, actually, the focus of the focus area could vary, and in the past, it has been in relation to violence against women by the state and non-state um, individuals or perpetrators, um, trying to uh, make or advocate for reforms, like legal reforms, where women and um, people from other oppressed communities' voices are heard and included. Um, also, like in the recent past, most of my engagement has been on building like critical consciousness based on progressive politics in general among the people, particularly the young activists. Um, when I say young, it's not by age necessarily. It could also be um, those who are joining the like, you know, movement, the social movement. Um, and could be from any um, age um, yeah, bracket. Um, so, so kind of building that progressive consciousness uh, and mostly with a queer or feminist uh, consciousness where we could speak out like that and build, I mean, acknowledge it and work towards it. Um, because, I mean, when I say that, I mean, for those listeners who who might not know much about Sri Lanka, I mean, the social and cultural taboos uh, and norms on, or rather patriarchal so, um, uh, norms and values are, like, deeply embedded and, uh, um, even, like, most uh, active social activists who identify as feminists or as queer activists um, do not necessarily get the opportunity to be out uh, like that, too. So... Um, we are still uh, fighting those battles as well. Um, yeah, so like my focus has been on um, traveling on journeys with such um, activists, social activists, uh, in building consciousness and like not necessarily building their consciousness, like building con- our consciousness and building a sense of community and uh, work towards. Um, our rights, or gaining our rights, or reinstating our rights, as well as creating um, social spaces where um, tough topics and uh, hard issues can be open about and negotiated or negotiated. Great. Um, I want to also invite Venuri into this conversation. Venuri, um, as a Sri Lankan American of Sinhalese descent, uh, what is your response um and reflections on the election results. I know it just came out, but hopefully you've had some chance to reflect. And uh, also, what does this mean uh, for Sri Lanka and the Sri Lankan diaspora? Sure. So I'm actually still processing the election result, even though it was pretty widely expected. Um, It was not a surprising result at all. Um, I think that anybody who cares about... uh, the health of Sri Lanka's democracy and good governance and human rights um, on the island should be concerned. Uh, And I think that those in the diaspora who are going to be disproportionately affected are, you know, those who belong to minority communities, um, Tamils, Muslims, and other religio-ethnic minorities um, who may be worried for their family members uh, who are in Sri Lanka. Um, I will say that as somebody who uh, was born to a Sinhalese Buddhist family, my feelings around the election results are extremely, again, complex and also uh, quite, you know, extremely, I'm going to use the word devastated. I'm quite devastated and fearful for uh, the future of Sri Lanka's democracy. Um, so those are, you know, those are my feelings, and I'm still very much processing uh, the results 
um right and um you know when you re- um something i didn't get to talk to you about earlier and this but this is a lot of your uh, research that you did um tell us about how the mm-hmm. media since you also write um and freelance as a journalist what is it uh what was the role of the media in the sri lankan media um in the elections so much of the sri lankan media is state controlled um including the two largest english language dailies and um certain segments of the vernacular press um i will say that uh those you know media outlets that are state controlled obviously um you know will legitimate the majoritarian singhalese buddhist power structures in sri lanka and will you know in these media discourses attempts to legitimate the rajapaksa regime's return to power um there are that said there are you know um independent media outlets that are doing fantastic work in sri lanka and publishing really critical uh and essential journal uh you know journalism right now in sri lanka um so that's what i will say on that okay gayatri do you have any thoughts before i ask you my next question um i mean i agree with what uh, when we said um yeah so uh, i mean i would also perhaps add um that there are journalists who are like you know doing good stuff i mean good when i say good stuff it's like um yeah so they they are facing the everyday struggles or like threat of being uh i mean because they are being bold and um Said, Gayatri, after, I'm gonna. I'm sorry. I'm gonna have to interrupt you. I'm mm-hmm. not able to hear you very clearly. Yeah. Do you have your headphones on? Would you mind? Okay. Would you mind taking it off? And that might make so the sound quality uh, yeah, sure. better. Sorry to interrupt. Sure. Cool. Can you get me to now? Yeah, I think it's better. Yeah, yeah. Can you start over? Just your response. Okay. Thank you. Yes, much better. Sure. <laughs> So I agree. I was saying that I agree with uh, what uh, when we just said, and just to add that despite the challenges and even threats to life, um, I mean there are journalists who have been doing great work as well. So it is. I mean, freedom of press or freedom of speech is deeply compromised or so, yeah, significantly compromised. However, there are uh, yeah good work being done too. Absolutely and uh, to provide a little bit more context um Sri Lanka has also uh been extremely difficult for journalists to be able to um tell their stories um there's been a lot of attacks on the media and that is the harsh context under which um even the post war has uh, situation has been unfolding uh, I believe um I also yeah. want to yeah. want us to go back and talk about you know the last time Sri Lanka was in the news um was back in april during the easter bombings that devastated the country uh when you maybe did you want to uh, comment on how mm-hmm. did the aftermath of that play out and how did it impact the elections that took place sure so the election results is widely viewed as a repudiation of the actions of the you know the coalition government uh between former president Maithripala Sirisena who belonged to the center left Sri Lanka Freedom Party and the prime minister uh, Ranil Wickremesinghe who was the leader of the United Nationalist Party which is center right and pro business and pro capitalist um so even though they swept into power in 2015 defeating uh former president Mahinda Rajapaksa and it was seen as you know um a win for democracy in sri lanka and you know a potential return to good governance unfortunately the reality was much more complicated and uh the sri lankan government essentially you know still um you know definitely uh uh subscribed to those um ideologies of singhala buddhist majoritarianism in sri lanka so um the reason why uh neither neither of those two politicians contested um in the in the most recent elections was because uh 
they did not they didn't have the support of their parties um mostly because of the way that they handled uh you know the um the aftermath of the easter bombings and also um the time preceding the easter bombings so they didn't heed warnings from the intelligence community particularly warnings from indian intelligence officers uh detailing a uh, potential imminent attack from the national tawhid jamaat um which was which is the group that's widely believed to have perpetrated the easter sunday bombings at uh several christian churches and uh hotels uh in different parts of sri lanka I so see. That's why um, that's why neither of those two leaders were uh, were seen as having a legitimate claim to power, and why the Rajapaksa family, which had design, which had designs on dynastic rule for quite some time, was able to ride in and really exploit that power vacuum. So, what happened was they were widely credited, particularly by the majority. Uh, Sinhalese population for ending um, an intractable 30-year-long civil war in Sri Lanka, which um, essentially was a war between the Sinhalese-led Sri Lankan government and uh, the guerrilla group, the Liberation Tamil Tigers of Elam, or the LTTE. And the Tamil the Tigers. LTT, mm-hmm. Yes, the Tamil Tigers. The, uh, the Tamil Tigers essentially were they can they were a de facto government controlling the uh, northern and eastern provinces, and uh, those provinces um, were home to majority of Tamil and Muslim uh, populations. So, um, so that's essentially what happened in this election result. It was it was you know definitely a rebuke to the previous government and their tepid response and what was viewed as their tepid response by um, the Sinhalese majority to uh, what the Sinhalese majority views to be Islamic fundamentalism in Sri Lanka. So that was how the Rajapaksa regime was able to sweep in and um, again, lay claim to uh, their legitimate, you know, legitimate their right to rule because they are widely seen as the government that finally defeated terrorism in Sri Lanka. And the LTT was an internationally prescribed terrorist group by the UN, the US, UK, and other Western governments. So that's definitely, um, you know, a big part of why they were able to uh, sweep into power. Wow. Um, Lots to talk about. Um, We should have a should, we should take a small music break and uh, after when we come back I want us to talk about um, civil society in Sri Lanka which continues to be quite robust despite a um, lot of attacks and onslaught um, by the mainstream and also about the rise of Buddhist fundamentalism I think is a very important conversation we don't hear enough so we'll be right right back after this break um, sure <laughs>
Listening to Apex Express on KPFA 94.1 FM. Um, that was a peppy music track by Rolex Rasati, a Tamar New Yorker activist musician. Um, so I just thought we'll balance out the grim conversation with some peppy music. Um, I have on air with me two wonderful guests, uh, Venuri Sirivardena from uh, calling us from New Jersey, calling us from calling in from New Jersey, and Gayatri. Uh, Kaitri, can am I telling? Am I pronouncing your last name right, Kaitri Divakalala? Kaitri, yeah, there. You got it right. Great. Exactly. So, Kaitri, coming back to you, tell yes, us about your there. I in would like. Uh, yes. Yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. Sorry, Priti. Uh, could I quickly respond to what uh, um, Venuru said before the break? Yes. Sorry, Is I didn't get a, give you a chance to do that. Yes, please. No worries. Yeah, so just to make, you know, um, yeah, uh, set the record uh, to, um, correct a bit. Um, not, I mean, uh, in terms of what Venerable said about the represents, I mean, the LTT, the Liberation Tigers of Tamil Adam, representing um, the people from the North and the East, including the Muslims. Um, I mean, I guess that's not really what happened or what they did. Um, so just to put uh, things into perspective, like so, in the post Easter attacks, um, that's I mean the uh, the response uh, given by the government uh, pre and uh, post Easter attacks um, is one of the significant reasons why people went with uh, I mean people needed the change or they people needed to get rid of them. However, that's not the only reason I, uh, as well. But uh, in terms of um, the fact, or the fact that uh, LGT is representing uh, the Muslims is something that they definitely never did, um, and uh, like you know we are quite or some at least some channels are very critical of uh, the LGT and particularly the fact that um, they evicted the Muslims. Uh, in 90s, uh, in the 90s, um, in 1990, from the north and the east. So, and um, they had never stepped up for, um, in terms of representing them. So, it's, uh, yeah, so I think this country has deep, um, I mean, huge problems in terms of represent, politic, particularly political representation uh, of the people in general, as well as particularly the the oppressed or the ethnic minorities mm-hmm. or minorities in other forms. Um, yeah, so like, you know, if we are, if we were to talk about the, um, for, I mean, uh, Easter attacks and uh, the implications of it, I mean, we could. But uh, yeah, perhaps just quickly, um, I mean, Islam, I mean, Islamophobia, sorry, Islamophobia is a global problem. And absolutely, I mean, we need to look at it, look at it. Um, from a global perspective than limiting ourselves to just single events such as what happened in Sri Lanka. I think that's what the previous con- that's where the previous government went wrong as well. They, you know, and the geopolitics of who controls the information that comes through and like, you know, mm-hmm. who takes the decision and on whose benefit definitely played a role. But uh, yeah, like, you know, we are still, I guess that's, I mean, the Easter Sunday attack um, is something that as a nation or as concerned citizens of this country, we are still processing and still trying to heal the wounds. And you know, if, even though the wars, I mean, wounds from the time of war are still alive and still, yeah, real. Yeah, and, uh, you know, the rise... Actually, yeah, do you sorry, want to respond, Venuri? Actually... Yeah. Uh, I do. I wanted to thank Kaya 3 for um, just making those points. And also, um, I wanted to quickly clarify, I don't believe I mentioned that the LTT ever represented the Muslims. Um, and Kaya 3 is quite right uh, that many Muslims were internally displaced from uh, the northern and eastern provinces. And that's why many of them uh, had to be bused 
to their home districts to vote um, in this uh, last election as well because of that internal displacement. So I just wanted to quickly cl- clarify what I said and also completely agree with Kayatri and thank her for okay. um, making that clarification. Thank you. Okay. Um, I want us to also, you know, one of the things you talked about, Gayatri, is the rising phenomenon of um, fundamental, um, both fundamentalism as well as um, Islamophobia that's on the rise. That's been heavily on the rise here in the U.S. Uh, for a long time now and, uh, and also in India yeah. uh, since the BJP has come to power yeah. and it's just now reached a peak, disturbing peak. Um could you speak to that a little bit more in the context of Sri Lanka? How does that play out? Uh, I think when you, you and I, when we talked earlier, also made some important points around how um, that has played out. And that and you spoke about it in the context of the elections, but more particularly in the context of um, Sri Lankan society. Um, could both of you weigh in on how uh, Islamophobia has risen within Sri Lanka? Sure. Um, do you want to go first? Yeah. Um, uh, you're you're more than welcome to go first, Kai Three. Um, yes, I mean I'm good. <laughs> go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, uh, so, uh, with respect to Islamophobia, I guess um, what I'll say is. Uh, I'll start first with um, Buddhist fundamentalism and um, its link to the rise of Islamophobia uh, sure. in Sri Lanka. So um, I'll say that um, Buddhist nationalism is nothing new in Sri Lanka. So it actually can be traced back to um, Sri Lanka's fourth prime minister, whose name was SWRD Bandaranayaka. And he was the founder of uh, the Sri Lanka Freedom Party or the uh, SLFP Party. So um, he was actually uh, a member of the anglicized Christian elite, and he was um, he actually saw a rising um, rising levels of agitation among a uh, Sinhala Buddhist rural class, and he converted to Buddhism um, and actually uh, courted. Um, courted the clergy or Buddhist monks in Sri Lanka, courted the, supported the clergy or the Buddhist monks in Sri Lanka and swept into power uh, in the 1956 parliamentary elections. Um, and he definitely exploited uh, those local um, Sinhala Buddhist rural resistance movements and publicly embraced, you know, an anti-Western Buddhist nationalist um, uh, you know, cultural ambition of um, that was widely, that was pretty prevalent among uh, Sinhalese um, population at the time. And, you know, you can definitely uh, see this continuation, this continued political tradition with um, successive, uh, successive governments in Sri Lanka. Um, and I would say that after the defeat of the LTTE by uh, Mahinda Rajapaksa's government in 2009, um, you saw this rise in hardline Buddhist nationalist groups. And um, perhaps one of the most prominent of those groups would be the Bodhu Balasena, um, which was uh, led by a hardline Buddhist nationalist monk. Um, and... Uh, this group actually, this monk actually gave several speeches inciting violence against Muslims, um, and it's believed by many uh, by many researchers and many observers that it was because you know the government needed a new bogeyman after the defeat of the LTT, um, you know the and the defeat of the Tamil separatist movement in Sri Lanka. Uh, the Sinhala Buddhist, you know, again, majoritarian um, political movement in Sri Lanka needed uh, needed an enemy and needed a bogeyman. So they turned to Sri Lankan Muslims who are a religio-ethnic minority in Sri Lanka. And historically, there were never these clashes between um, the majority Sinhala, Sinhalese population and uh, the Muslims 
but um, we began to see this in the aftermath of the war, and it's continued ever since with outbreaks of uh, communal violence. And um, much of this incitement and hate speech is spreading rapidly, uh, you know, among uh, the Sinhalese populations in Sri Lanka through the use of Facebook um, and WhatsApp, which Mm -hmm. is why, um, you know, in the aftermath of... uh, the outbreak of communal violence against Muslims in early 2018. And then again, after the Easter Sunday bombings, the Sri Lankan government took the very authoritarian move of um, actually banning, uh, blocking the use of Facebook. Um, So in order to prevent the spread of these rumors. So um, that's actually a little bit of context there. Right. And, you know, coming back to the, um, the the rise of Buddhist fundamentalism, it's also tied to what's happening in Myanmar against the Rohingya Muslims there. Did you want to speak to those ties a little bit, Venuri? And then I wanted uh, Gayatri to weigh in on on what you what you also shared. Sure. So uh, the Bodhi, the Bodhu Balasena um, is actually was actually cooperating with the 969 anti-Muslim movement in Myanmar, which was led by, a, you know, a Theravada Buddhist monk uh, named Ashin Wiratu. And uh, both Sri Lanka and Myanmar are Theravada Buddhist countries, and Theravada Buddhism is one of the oldest uh, forms of Buddhism. Very distinct from the early... other forms, right? right. Yes. Yeah. It's, uh, so Buddhism actually, uh, the birthplace of Buddhism is actually in modern day Nepal. And um, again, Theravada Buddhism is seen as a very purist form of the faith um, and is very similar to those early forms of Buddhism. So there's solidarity between um, hardline Buddhist forces in Sri Lanka and in Myanmar Myanmar, because they practice, um, again, the same Theravada strain of the faith. And um, it's been reported that the leader of the uh, Bodhu Balasena, Nanasara Thero, and Ash- Ashin Wiratu um, have actually been in talks with each other. And I believed that Wiratu attended a, a Buddhist Sangha conference uh, that was put on by the Bodhu, Bodhu Balasena, um, you know, in recent years. And I think those two movements are definitely operating in solidarity with each other and learning from each other. And it should be noted that the that this anti-Muslim movement um, led by this Buddhist monk in Myanmar is a driving force behind what is widely believed to be the perpetration of genocidal forces against the Rohingya population, which is a a stateless um, Muslim minority um, uh, that um, is, you know, uh, believed to be indigenous to Myanmar, um, but um, many have fled and are in refugee camps in Bangladesh right now. It's a very grim situation uh, for Muslims across South Asia. Uh, and listening to you just confirm that. Um, Kayatri, did you want to weigh in on on the rise of Buddhist fundamentalism in Sri Lanka and also uh, Islamophobia? Ga- Gayatri, are there? Um, so, can you hear me? Yes. Go ahead. Okay. So, like uh, when we just said, um, the symbol of Buddhist nationalism is definitely not new to this country. And it clearly has, or seems like it clearly uh, has the agenda of uh, writing off the minority, ethnic minorities of this country. So, I mean, now, indeed, they started the war with the uh, Tamils, who are the uh, majority within the minority in the country. Um, and that was, I mean, they defeated the LTT in 2009, and that, I mean, victory was celebrated so much. Um, since they thought that, so again, the understanding of uh, minority problems itself um, has not been really uh, addressed there or even taken seriously because LTT was only one element who that was fighting. Um, for the rights of the Tamil people. However, uh, I mean, there were other forces and social movements, individuals who were 
doing the same thing that is a non-violent rape. However, the dominance of similar Buddhist nationalism has shown us that it could only tackle one thing, and like which was the LDG. And as a defeat of that means that everyone is now um, like you know free, and like you know minority concerns weren't never uh, like you know um, like didn't mean anything to them. And so when when the war ended and they thought that they had been defeated and the minority problems are solved, the other um, the immediate other significant minorities in the country are is Muslims. So the like like uh, when we just said the uh, the formation of uh Bela for, I mean, popularly known as BBS in, I mean, in India, um, was precisely to, or, I mean, their values were to reinstate similar national, uh, Buddhist nationalism and to eliminate any threat to establish that or any threat to sustaining such a nationalistic uh, um, point of view or way of living in this country. So immediately Muslims became the next target, and oh, yes, they did want a boogeyman too. However, I mean, that has history and context as well. I mean, it did not come um, out of the blue. So they wanted to get rid of uh, or make threaten the next uh, minority community here, which is, which is the Muslims, and the attacks, the systematically planned attacks against Muslim folks started, if I'm not wrong, sometime in 2010 and or 2011 in Alitgama, which is uh, which is a popular coastal town, um, touristic place as well, in the south of uh, south of Colombo, which is the capital, um, south of, uh, yeah, south of Colombo, uh, yeah, of Sri Lanka. So, and the attacks were brutal, and since then we have been seeing periodical uh, systematically planned attacks against the Muslim communities um, um, in Sri Lanka. And the response is that um, the government has been given um, to these attacks. Uh, I mean, you know, if, if you ask me, that reminded me of the ADP riot and the riot before against Tamil folks, all Tamils of this country. So there is a clear pattern. And, um, yeah, like, I guess the Islam or Islamophobic um, like across the world, or what we see in, in, in the world, has also been contributing to this factor. And I'm pretty sure there will be a number of forces um, who does support Islamophobia would be um, like you no know, financing these uh, forces in Sri Lanka and countries like Myanmar. Um, and there's a, like you mentioned, pretty, like in inside Asia and again, like, you know, everywhere else too. Um, so, yeah, so there are clear patterns that we could see just beyond the black or white of the situation. However, sadly, those patterns aren't being emphasized or, like, you know, made sense um, from a critical point of view where we the aim to stop these forces or, like, yeah, like, yeah, mm-hmm. stop them from using. Absolutely. Um, we're going to take another Thank short music care. break. Yeah. And when we come back, I want us to also talk a little bit more about hopeful stuff. Like the there is a robust civil society too. And there's a lot of activism, LGBT rights uh, activism that thrives in Sri Lanka. So I want us to also focus on some of the good stuff coming out. I know it's bleak times everywhere across South Asia. But we'll be back right after this music break. Thank you. 
Apex Express on KPFA 94.1 FM. Um, that was uh, Brooklyn Dream Wolves uh, track Motherland. Um, I I have with me two wonderful guests on air on the phone with me. Um, Gayatri, unfortunately, uh, your line is not very clear. Otherwise, what we'd love to have you on for longer. Um, are you still able to take out oh. the earbuds? Are you able to hear me? Yeah, yeah. So I am. I mean, yeah. Oh, it's um, better now. Okay, let's stick I to this. Headphone. Okay. okay. Now it was a bit uh, yeah, the, yeah. earlier. It was we were struggling to hear you, even though you had some very important stuff to say. Uh, I wanted you to talk a little bit about civil society in Sri Lanka. You're part of a, some wonderful feminist activists and movements there. Uh, can you shine a light a little about that a little bit for our listeners? Um, everything. There's a lot of bleak, uh, you know, context that we just went over, but uh, we also should also focus on the hopeful and the optimistic. Sure. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so uh, just to uh, reinstate that, uh, of course, this. I mean, we are not. I wouldn't say the civil society or the social uh, movement folks are uh, hopeless, so they don't feel that. Like, of course, despite we have had, yeah, huge challenges and great challenges in the past. So um, that. I mean, I wouldn't say. I mean, I'm not comparing. However. Um, yeah, just to say that we are still hopeful. I mean, we would need time to readjust and make, you know, get creative to do what we have been doing, but uh, the work will be done. And um, yeah, along some pretty strong progressive politics uh, ideologies. So, one of which is uh, feminist activism in the country. And um, again, I'm not going to generalize and I don't mean to represent all of them, all of their work, but a few that I could uh, point out uh, are um, uh, the following. So, um, like activists have been engaged in uh, like um, work on transitional justice, um, building harmony among ethnicities, and like kind of promoting coexistence in peace, or valuing the idea of peace, or like trying to figure out how, despite what had happened, despite uh, brutal like violent histories, how could we still kind of understand each other? and uh, coexist beyond uh, our differences. And um, there have been a few, a couple of um, constitutional reforms related work and like no law reforms. Uh, One is the land reform, um, which is still like, you know, yeah, it's still happening. And um, yeah, like, you know, uh, in terms of how much we have been able to achieve is or how much we have been able to achieve is um, um, yeah, uh, not very um, big. However, there have been small uh, victories as well along the way. Um, and there is something called um, Muslim Marriage and Divorce Act uh, reform. I mean, there's a group, I mean, a group of just activists just got together and, um, yeah, they have been doing incredible uh, work um, in the country. It's still ongoing and they have a website as well. It's um, like the acronym is called MMDA. Um, then, like I mentioned earlier, um, that some of us have been, like myself, have been focusing on building a critical uh, public or like, um, yeah, like traveling along with the young social activists um, where we share the history that we know and we have lived through and um, try to, again, make sense of our shared histories and, um, yeah, like... Um, lived experiences of fear, pain, trauma, um, loss, 
uh, and tragedy in general, um, but at the same time not as uh, victims or uh, not as uh, the living uh, victimhood, have, but instead uh, focusing on what kind of agency that we could bring out of this, out of ourselves as well as um, the, our shared history and um, what could be shared mm-hmm. um, with yeah, with the, with the rest of us, the uh, rest of the people, on a positive note. Wonderful. Um, we need to wrap up. We're towards the end of the show. Time went by quickly. Uh, Benuri, do you have any quick closing thoughts before we wrap up? Thank you so much, both of you, um, for weighing sure. in. Sure. Uh, yeah. I think uh, I'll just speak to the need for critical resistance movements in the diaspora. Um, I think that... Uh, there are absolutely robust elements of um, activism in the diaspora, particularly in hubs in New York City and Toronto and London um, and in Sydney, Australia. So I definitely Mm -hmm. think there needs to be solidarity between those diasporic movements and movements on the ground in Sri Lanka, movements um, that Kaya 3 really is at the vanguard of. Um, and I also want to thank Kaya 3 so much for her really important and crucial work uh, in Sri Lanka. Thank you so much. Well, thank you both of you. Thank you, Venuri, for your rich insight and analysis yeah. and the work thank you're doing. You, and yeah. Thank you, Gayatri, for all your activism and insights and, uh, you know, power to the movement on the ground. Um, and I and unfortunately we have to wrap up our show a little bit abruptly because there's so much to talk about. Uh, I want to thank both of you for just shedding a light on the elections in Sri Lanka and what's been happening. Uh, that brings us to an end to our discussion tonight. I've had uh, Venuri Siniwar Siriwardena and Gayatri Devakalala on air with me. Um, and I've been your host and producer, Preeti Mangla Shekhar. Uh, do join Apex Express's online community on Facebook and follow our WordPress blog. Email us, show ideas and feedback at apex at kpfa.org. Tune back in next week for another edition of Apex Express. A big thank you to Free Willing Frank for our pod op. Um, our theme music is by Asian Crisis. KPFA for a special screening of the political and satirical thriller The Manchurian Candidate, starring Frank Sinatra, Angela Lansbury, and Janet Lee, on Saturday, November 23rd at 3 p.m. at the New Parkway Theater in Oakland. This 1962 Cold War classic tells the story of a platoon of U.S. soldiers captured by enemies and turned into brainwashed sleepers near the end of the Korean War. I told them to build me an assassin. I wanted a killer from a world filled with killers, and they chose you. We'll explore how the movie still holds up to present-day politics with a post-movie discussion led by Mitch Jezerich, host of Pacifica Radio's Letters and Politics. The Manchurian Candidate screens Saturday, November 23rd at 3 p.m. at the New Parkway Theater in Oakland. For more information, visit kpfa.org or thenewparkway.com. The 2019 annual Cranway Crafts Fair is a Bay Area cultural treasure. The fair takes place December 21st and 22nd from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. on both days in the gorgeous Cranway Pavilion in Richmond, California. The fair showcases 200 diverse exhibitors, including both master artisans and emerging newcomers. Their original art and crafts fill the pavilion along with fair trade and nonprofit vendors, live entertainment, and food catered by local catering businesses. Again, that's December 21st and 22nd from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. For more information, visit kpfa.org. This wheelchair accessible event is a benefit for KPFA. You're listening to 94.1 KPFA, 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, 97.5 K248BR in Santa Cruz, and online worldwide at kpfa.org. 
Oh, can't fool me this time. I was waiting for you to do that station identification, and indeed you did.